Hello everyone. Welcome to the Cabfish Man webinar. My name is Mark James. Um, I'm going to be hosting this meeting today from the University of St Andrews that's one of the partners in this project. And uh, just to remind you that the Cabfish Man logo stands for Conserving Atlantic Biodiversity by Supporting Innovative Small Scale Fisheries Co-Management. Over the next few minutes, I'll try to explain to you very briefly what that means and introduce some of the organizations and the people involved with the project and talk a little bit about what we hope to achieve through this webinar today. So after my brief introduction, we will have two short presentations, about 15 minutes each. The first one will relate to assessing the impact of small scale fisheries. And then the next one will relate to measuring the economic and cultural value of small scale fisheries. The first will be delivered by a colleague from the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, Declan Tobin, and uh, another colleague, Paolo Vasconcelos from IPMA in Portugal. An economic and cultural small scale fisheries presentation will be delivered by Arantha Morales of ASTI, who is leading this whole project, and David Castilla of University of Huelva. After that, we'll have a, a short Q&A session and then try and draw some of the conclusions together in some concluding remarks. The whole webinar should not take more than half an, uh, an hour and a half. And uh, only really the first part of the webinar is likely to be recorded. When we get to the Q&A session, um, we will probably not record at that point so that everybody can ask questions or uh, in debate around subject areas that may or may not um, uh, be public and, and feel free to actually engage in a conversation uh, where it won't necessarily be in the public domain beyond uh, this webinar. So why are we interested in small scale fisheries? I think it's important to remind ourselves that within the EU, small scale fisheries represent 80% of all vessels and globally about 90% of all vessels come into that small scale fisheries category. Now, we can all debate around what small scale fisheries actually means, and it means different things to different peoples in, in different countries. But generally it takes place relatively close to shore, relatively small vessels uh, with short uh, trips at sea. The fact is that it is the largest employment of fishers around the world. It's geographically very dispersed, but one of its major characteristics is that it tends to be very fragmented, both at a central level, so within the industry it's very fragmented, its governance tends to be quite uh, disparate, and regulation is often very patchy. Part of that is because it's one of the least understood fisheries that we have, and as a result, it tends to be the least well managed. But this does actually re represent a global challenge. One of the reasons is not only because it employs a very large number of people, millions of people around the world are engaged in small scale fisheries, but it's actually a very important part of basic nutrition in many coastal communities around the world. But one of the things that has restricted us in the past is, is our ability to actually collect data on the fishery, but because of things like mobile telephones, uh, low cost sensors, new technologies uh, that are now much more freely available, that are allowing us to collect data from small scale fisheries and opening up a whole new dimension um, in the information that's available to us to think about how we can better manage those fisheries and most importantly co-manage those fisheries that are with the people that are actually involved on the ground in taking part in that fishery. Part of that process is also about recognizing the economic, social and cultural value of the fishery which we don't really know very much about but we do know that it is very important particularly in some parts of Europe and in other countries around the world. There are also some important drivers uh, around the uh, small scale fishery in terms of why we need to understand it and better manage it. Obviously there's climate change and then there are general issues around sustainability. If we think about climate change in the first instance, the coastal communities um, will effectively be on the front line of, of climate change in terms of uh, sea level rise and also in terms of the effect of the intensity or increasing intensity of storms uh, and the, the potential for increasing frequency and intensity of storms around our coasts, invasive species and a whole range of other climate change issues that will impact on coastal communities and small scale fisheries, perhaps disproportionately and not uh, too long in the future. 
The image that you see there on the bottom left hand side is actually a reflection of the situation we find ourselves in now with COVID. This picture was taken by a colleague, Kyla Raw, uh, lives in the far northwest of Scotland, and it shows uh, some people there socially distancing, waiting to buy shellfish from a fisherman directly from his vessel. The reason that he's selling directly from his vessel is because the supply chains that he would normally be involved in are actually live export chains to southern Europe and they have completely collapsed and so we've had to find new ways of continuing to find markets for shellfish and to maintain that business throughout the COVID period and I think it's opened people's eyes up to the fragility of some of our supply chains and our markets and uh, the whole issue of sustainability around some small-scale fisheries particularly on the west coast of Scotland. So catfish itself the, 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 the whole ethos of the project is around managing fisheries better, um, but managing it in, in a way that engages all of the key stakeholders in an appropriate way. So this isn't about top-down management. It isn't about rigorous regulation. It's about finding ways to co-manage fisheries in these difficult circumstances so that we can actually make sure that we uh, maintain biodiverse ecosystems uh, and also in recognizing that that ecosystem includes the fishermen and the societies within which they, which they work as part of that whole picture. Catfish Man involves 28 organizations from the Northeast Atlantic region from five separate countries. Those organizations are found in Spain, Portugal, France, Ireland, and in the UK. And we're all working together around this inter interdisciplinary research project focusing on the small-scale fisheries in each of those regions. And they are very different. Uh, the small-scale fishery we have in Scotland uh, is very different to the ones that exist, for example, in Spain and Portugal. The project maps the interactions between fishing activities, sensitive habitats and species. And it, we're using that information to try to design tools to support decision-making. The research also draws on that heritage, that social economic a picture that we need to understand if we are to develop uh, processes, systems, data collection that is meaningful and actually reflects what's going on on the ground. So what we're engaged in today is exactly the first of these categories on the left hand side which is about stakeholder cooperation and stakeholder feedback. It's also about protecting the resource itself and addressing what we call transnational challenges, those things that are similar across borders. Uh, we're all, for example, looking at new ways of tracking vessels, uh, new ways of trying to collect data from these small scale vessels, and sharing that between us is actually an extremely useful and productive process. We all know that we've got to move to this very strange thing called ecosystem-based management, and to be frank, I don't think anybody really knows exactly what that means, particularly in the context of small scale fisheries, and our challenge is to try and define what that means and how we might do that. Um, so that we can both satisfy regulation and aspirations of various directives, but also ensure that it's a meaningful process and that it leads to the preservation of biodiversity. So what does the project involve? Communication and stakeholder engagement? Well, that's partly what we're involved in today. It's about making sure that the messages from the project are disseminated, but also that we receive stakeholder feedback. It would have been great to have met you all face to face. That isn't going to happen as a result of COVID, but hopefully we will be able to get sufficient uh, input from you today and perhaps subsequently after this meeting uh, to be able to inform the way the project develops and the, the sorts of tools we develop are useful at the end of the day. We've also, within the project, got to define the scale and the scope of small scale fisheries in that Northeast Atlantic region. We're evaluating the social, cultural, and economic footprint, as I've already said. And then the trick at the end of the day, and the difficult trick, is how do we synthesize all of that into something that's useful? Well, we hope to develop quite a sophisticated GIS or geographic information system platform that will there be there for stakeholders and not just um, the normal, if you like, government and management stakeholders, but also for individuals to be able to interrogate at different levels to be able to inform their thinking, their decision making. This webinar is part of a series and it's the first in that series. The first is taking place in the UK today. Uh, there will be one in Ireland, France, Portugal and Spain over the next few weeks. 
And it's critical that we use those opportunities in each country to be able to look at regional differences and to be able to get feedback from different stakeholders, different communities, different cultural norms, different ways of thinking about things and reflecting the differences between those small scale fisheries. So that at the end of the day, hopefully the tools that are produced will be fit for purpose. So I will now hand you over to our first speaker. Uh, the title of the presentation will be Assessing the Impact of Small Scale Fisheries. So I'd like to welcome Declan Tobin and Paolo Vasconcelos to deliver the first presentation. This next presentation will follow immediately after that on the um, economic and cultural value, and then we'll be able to get into uh, a more detailed question and answer session. So I will hand you over now. Okay, can everybody hear me? Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Mark, for the introduction. Um, my name is Declan Tobin, and I work for the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, and I'm based up in Aberdeen here in the UK. And I'll be presenting this along with Paolo Vasconcelos, as Mark mentioned. He works for the National Marine Meteorological Institute, Institute in Portugal and he's the work package lead for uh, this particular work package. Next slide, please. So this component, work package five, is uh, designed to assess the impact of small scale fisheries, and it ties in nicely with what Mark introduced. It links to uh, the ecosystem approach element um, to future fisheries management, it also has an element of stakeholder engagement, and we'll talk through that shortly, particularly around um, the tools that are being developed. And the tools uh, within this work package will ultimately be part of a suite of, um, of outputs that will support decision-making. Now, the work package itself, as mentioned, is led by Paolo, but in conjunction with his colleagues for the Center of Marine um, Science in Portugal, as well as uh, the University of, of the Algarve. Next slide, please. Um, I, this particular presentation, we're gonna divide it up. So I'm gonna give the first few slides and then I'm gonna hand over to Paolo and Paolo is gonna give a bit more detail on the methods that he's developed for the uh, work package. But I'm gonna introduce sort of the background and some of the elements around uh, the statistics and the data that we're using to input to the work package. The, uh, as already mentioned, the work package itself is designed to look at the uh, impact associated with uh, small scale fisheries. And we're not just talking about uh, impacts in the environment, we're also talking about potential impacts that relate to the fishery. And uh, one of the main objectives with this work package is the design uh, of a common methodology to use right across that um, Atlantic area um, from Portugal all the way up to Scotland and to um, estimate the uh, impacts associated with the fishing gear per habitat type, um, and also to, um, uh, to uh, seek stakeholder input to help with the, um, the population of the impacts um, methodology. Okay, next slide, please. So in terms of actions, uh, the project is seeking to design this uh, joint method, which I'll mention a little bit more shortly uh, for the impact um, or assessment of impacts of small scale fishery, and also uh, to assess based on the outputs from that impact assessment, how that relates to impacts on specific habitats. And ultimately, the idea would be to enable the uh, development or proposal of potential mitigation options associated with the information that we've gleaned from the project. Next slide, please. So in terms of specific tasks, well, unsurprisingly, the first task for this work package was to define what we mean by small scale fisheries. As Mark alluded to in his introduction, there isn't a univer uh, universal description of what small scale fisheries mean. Uh, so the first task was very much to decide amongst the project partners at a country level uh, what we mean by small scale um, fisheries and also to extract the data based on that. And then the next step was in conjunction with project partners in each of the countries, the partner countries, to identify what the main fishing gears would be associated with the small scale fleet. And then 
the key element for this work and probably what we've spent the last number of most months most involved with, uh, with was the development of the joint method. And Paolo is going to take you through it in more detail, but ostensibly the method is designed to look at each fishing gear and to assess a range of pressures associated with those, um, that gear, whether it be physical pressure, say, for example, impact on seabed, direct um, impact on seabed or noise, litter, those types of things through to the biological impacts, which might be the removal of target species from a fishery or indeed uh, non-target, non-commercial or bycatch. So say things like impacts on marine mammals or birds. And then um, ultimately to use uh, various criteria to assess what they, uh, those impacts might be based on the intensity of impact for a given gear type the frequency with which that gear type or a fishing event um, may occur and may interact, say for example, again with the seabed uh, and the duration of the impact. So how long it might take to recover or what the long-term effects might be. And rating those on a scale, simple scale from high to low to uh, that summing across the criteria provides us with um, an ability to assess the impact. But again, Paolo will take you through that in a little bit more detail shortly. Once the uh, methodology has been established and we're comfortable with the methodology, the next step is to bring stakeholders together to help us populate that table and to enable uh, and all of you to use your expert judgment and your experience working in the marine environment or working with small scale fisheries to help score those impacts. So we come to uh, and be able to rank the fishing gears in terms of impacts associated with the environment. And then we can use the information from the ranking to uh, overlay with what we understand around the distribution of habitats, specific habitats. And uh, that could be related to designated or protected habitats, but also to the wider marine environment. So it's not, it's not exclusive. It's very much depends on the questions being asked by those making the decisions. Next slide, please. So in terms of the UK, well, um, the traditional uh, definition of small scale fisheries in the UK has typically been under 10 meters, um, but that's not necessarily the same with all of the other partner countries. Uh, typically under 12 meters would be a better classifier or threshold uh, for the other partner countries. But for the sake of consistency, we've divided um, based on, or we've used both or presented the data for both. So you can see um, across each of the member states uh, how the uh, fisheries of the small scale fisheries relate to one another. Uh, there are just over 3000 vessels on the Atlantic coast of the UK um, under 12 meters. And the difference between the under uh, 12 and under 10 isn't huge. There's about 200, 250 vessel difference uh, between the under 10 and under 12. Next slide, please. Now, for anybody that knows anything about fishing in the UK, it probably won't come as a major surprise to know that the majority of vessels active in the UK on the Western coast and the Atlantic coast tend to come from the West of Scotland and the Southwest of England. So Cornwall, Devon, Dorset area. And together they make up about 90, or apologies, about 70% of the overall vessels active on the west um, coast of the UK. When you consider Wales and Northern Ireland, that brings the number up to about 90%. But critically, there are vessels registered uh, right the way through the Atlantic coast from the west of Scotland through the Irish Sea right down into the um, southwest. Next slide, please. So my last slide is to just introduce the main fishing gears. Um, with the fleet register, there are 32 gears registered for UK vessels. And of those, 29 are represented by the under 12 meter fleet. And the main take home message here really is that the vast majority of gears on the register are associated um, or are represented within the small scale fishing um, sector. That's probably not a surprising uh, finding. But what was interesting is that of those 32, realistically, the vast majority is captured uh, by 10 gears and actually for the top five gear types in the UK, they represent uh, approximately 90% of the overall 
um, gears in the small scale fleet. Over half of those are pots and traps with the remainder predominantly made up of um, roughly 10% uh, of hand and um, of line fishing, uh, net fishing and bottom trawl. So um, yeah, it kind of gives you a good indication of uh, the, the distribution of um, activities or different fishing gear types uh, within the UK. Okay, um, I think that's a quick run through the activity side. Um, I might hand over to Paolo now and he'll talk a little bit more around um, the method. So over to you, Paolo. Thank you, Declan. Uh, as you just uh, mentioned, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we are working still uh, with a draft version, which is under development, a draft version of our multi-criteria evaluation matrix, which uh, to assess the main fishing impacts of small scale fisheries. Um, despite being still a draft version, but it is uh, is already well developed. It received uh, contributions from uh, several partners within the, the project framework. Um, this, this matrix is more or less organized into three different types of fishing pressures and then subdivided into interactions or impacts. So we, we have uh, in, in this matrix uh, physical and chemical pressures biological and ecological pressures, and also uh, direct uh, pressures exerted uh, by the fishery itself. Regarding the types of interactions uh, or impacts that we wish to, to evaluate, uh, in terms of physical and chemical impacts, we have uh, the interaction to the bottom, problems of bottom degradation or destruction, depending on the type of bottom, rocky bottoms, sandy bottoms, muddy bottoms. We have uh, issues related with the uh, remobilization of, of pollutants that were previously accumulated uh, in bottom sediments. Uh, also questions related with uh, water column turbidity that might eventually promote uh, nutrient enrichment or even a phenomena of eutrophication. But we also have other issues uh, related, for instance, with uh, fuel consumption and gas emissions during fishing operations, the eventual uh, production of, uh, of uh, noise either by the, the fishing boat or the, or the, or the gear, for instance, uh, during trawling or dredging over the bottom, uh, or another example, uh, if you think about uh, nets e equipped with fingers to, to avoid interactions with marine mammals, and we have also in this part of physical and chemical uh, pressures, the questions are related with the production of litter. For instance, due to the release or, or due to the damage or loss of fishing gears and for instance, plastic uh, fishing gear. Regarding the biological and uh, ecological uh, pressures, we have subjects related to the damage and loss of uh, protected or threatened uh, habitats, for instance, uh, hot fire habitats, directive habitats, uh, impacts caused directly in, in uh, marine protected areas. And we have also uh, items related with damage, uh, with the bycatch and damage of both protected species. So for instance, we can specify in detail uh, if we have bycatch, uh, damage mortality of uh, seahorses, turtles, marine mammals, seabirds, depending on the, the type of fishery, the type of fishing gear and the uh, and, uh, geographical area, as well as uh, bycatch uh, problems of bycatch uh, mortality or damage of non-target species. For instance, the, the accessory catch of uh, seaweed, ventricular vertebrates, other non-target uh, pelagic or, or uh, the morsel fishes, sharks and rays, and other that can also be specified. Uh, finally, regarding the fishery itself, we, we aim to score uh, items or impacts related with discards and damaged mortalities, either of non-commercial fishes, but also of target species that might uh, be discarded 
for instance, because they are below the, the minimum, minimum lending size or because they are damaged and not suitable to be introduced in the, in the wholesale market. Finally, the matrix uh, contemplates also issues related to potential occurrence of uh, ghost fishing, as well as uh, eventual conflicts with other fishing uh, gears uh, in both the terms of uh, competition for, for space or, or for resources. We, we, we aim to classify, uh, depending on the type of fishing gear, uh, we aim to classify these this types of fishing impacts in terms of their impacts or proportion. Impact is more related with the physical and chemical pressures. Proportion is more related to an, estim an estimated uh, proportion of uh, bycatch or discards produced by the fishing. But also in terms of its frequency, whether it's a uh, a rare process of, or is, is a very frequent process and also in terms of the, the duration if it is if this impact is immediate or it might range from the short term to the long term which will provide us a better notion regarding the, the resilience of the habitats regarding the in terms of these impacts overall each type of fishing gear or each type of the main types of fishing gears used by the small scale fisheries in each country will be scored, uh, the impacts will be evaluated. And finally, we will uh, use a, a weighing process to estimate the final classification of each type of fishing gears and then rank the, the, the fishing gears depending on the estimated impacts that uh, they might cause. Next slide, please. So regarding the work in progress in, the, in this work pack, package, and specifically for the, the action one, we have already concluded the definition of the small scale fishing uh, fleet segment for each country that is partnered in this project. So we have defined the small scale fishing segment for the UK, Ireland, Spain, and Portugal. And we have together with this information, all based on the data gathered from the EU fleet register, we have also identified the main types of fishing gears used by the small scale fishing fleet in each of these countries. Uh, currently, we are still improving the, the above mentioned evaluation metrics, and we are starting to make some pre-testing of the matrix for uh, variable, variable types of fishing gears in order to assess if everything is working fine. We expect to have a, a final version of this matrix uh, in a few weeks. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps for this work package five, uh, we will uh, proceed we will proceed with the scoring and ranking of the fishing gears based on the stakeholders' expert judgment. Uh, we will count for this purpose with the knowledge and experience uh, from diverse types of, of, uh, of stakeholders, ranging from researchers, administrators, uh, managers, but with a strong emphasis on the fishing sector. We wish to have the contribution the technical expertise from the fishing sector, namely from the fisheries associations, fishermen organizations, uh, and, other, and other contributors that uh, might provide us solid information on these topics. Then we will proceed with the identification and mapping of the main habitats that are potentially impacted by the activity of small scale fisheries. And finally, we will propose, or at least we will try to propose uh, potential mitigation measures to minimize those impacts previously, previously identified. So in brief and as a summary, by, over, uh, by overlapping these, different, uh, these three different layers of information coming from the evaluation of the fishing impacts, the estimation of the fishing effort, and the knowledge on the habitat mapping, we wish to have a uh, uh, improved knowledge on the um, on the activity of small scale fisheries and to have uh, a broader and better notion on the spatial and temporal distribution of the the activity of small scale fisheries throughout the atlantic area next slide please 
and that's all. And I thank you all for your attention. And we expect to have a, a solid participation commitment from the stakeholders within the framework of this catfishment project. Thanks a lot. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm David Castilla. I'm, I'm introducing this, uh, this, this, uh, this presentation with uh, uh, Arancha Murilla uh, related to, to, to working pack at six and, and seven of Cap Fishman uh, project. Uh, well, next slide. Okay. Uh, the, the, the title we, we have changed a little bit the title of this of this of this presentation with a, a to to be more fair regarding the content of it. Uh, the, the title is total economic value of uh, small scale fisheries, cultural value, natural value, and food provisioning. And here you can see the partners involved in the in the in the presentation. Uh, Asti, University of Huelva, Oviedo in Spain, Cefa San Ostan in in United Kingdom, the being in, in Ireland, uh, University of Algarve in Portugal, um, we make an ephemer in France. Next slide, please. Okay, we would like to, to begin just uh, quoting uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we were created then. Uh, when we quote this, we just want to say that it is very important that uh, we change our mind the way we uh, manage uh, fisheries. Uh, we, we cannot consider them in an isolated way. We, we have to uh, measure the value of fisheries and marine ecosystem as a whole in a different way. And these are very important issues that allow us to avoid underestimate the value of fishing when we are managing them in terms of uh, 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 cost benefit uh, uh, decisions uh, so that we put in value uh, what are the, uh, the, the results of the, of the service that uh, in, in, in fact uh, fisheries provide. Next slide, please. Okay, for that, uh, the, 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 the main point is that we have to change our mind in just thinking of not only biology, which is uh, the focus historically uh, in the case of the management of fisheries, but also thinking on socioeconomic variables. And when we say socioeconomic, it also include cultural values and some other variables like employment or the, or the, the coastal communities uh, attachment to, the, to their villages. Uh, we have to think that uh, feature is nothing is, is something that is not isolated in the in the in the coast. Uh, there are in on, in the in the in the sea ecosystem. There are many other things. So there are many other activities and human uses competing with fisheries activity. And we have to measure some way the trade-off between habitat conservation and the fish stock, uh, and the. And the, and the socioeconomic uh, and the species, and also uh, considering competing human uses. Uh, uh, focusing on the main concept that we, we want to, to consider in terms of fisheries issues, we have to think in what is ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the direct and indirect contribution of ecosystem to human well-being. So in the case of fisheries, we are not only talking about uh, food provision, which is normally the, the, what we consider when we talk about fisheries, but also some other regulating services, cultural services provided by fisheries, and also some supporting services of ecosystem that allow us to maintain uh, them with primary production. Uh, in the case of the ISIS regions management, we, in the case of catfishman, our main objective is just to, 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 to 
highlight the socioeconomic significance of small-scale fisheries in the selected ice areas uh, of the Atlantic are we analyzing in the context of uh, catfish map. Next slide, please. Now I, 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 I will give the, 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 the voice to, to Arancha that we continue with this presentation. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, in this slide, we want to, as David is uh, saying to all of us, uh, we need to remark the socioeconomic issues because um, in the balance, we need to take into account also the, the socioeconomic issues when we want to approach to an ecosystem-based uh, management. And then in this slide, we want to start with the um, first ecosystem services, which is the provisioning uh, value. And we want to show to all of you that uh, what uh, we want to do is to provide the economic assessment of the provisioning ecosystem service and for doing it, we have selected a business indicator. The business indicator is the gross added value, uh, which is no more than the revenues minor the main um, operational cost. And <clears throat> in, the, in the figure that you have in the top uh, left in this slide, you can see a gray area in which we can see which is the uh, amount of gross added value which is provided by each of the ICS regions to this uh, provisioning value. As you can see this gray area, is, uh, there are some inequalities uh, depending on the area, but the, the, the first uh, four uh, ICS areas, the 9A, 8A and 7E e and D, are the, the more relevant when providing the gross added value to the Atlantic area in terms of the provisioning ecosystem value. You can also see some lines which represents the gross added value by, by fishing effort because it is also very important to, to remark which is the evolution in time of this variable. Of course, as uh, I will show to do later, we are develop <coughs> sorry, we are developing a geo tool in which uh, uh, you will be able to, to get a knowledge on the uh, economic assessment of the provisioning by value by fishing area, by country, by vessel length, by vessel technology, at any level you want to, to reach. But um, I would like to, to move into the, into the second figure because uh, it is also very important to take into account which is the cost structure. I mean, when we selected the added value, uh, this is an approach in contrast to a price approach, to a revenue approach in which we only take in, into account which is the value of the revenues to, to, to provide an economic assessment of the provisioning value. However, that is not the correct approach. It's very important to move into a gross added value approach because in that approach, we consider the cost structure, which is the evolution uh, at the different areas and which is the evolution in time of the variable costs uh, and in particular, the energy costs, which are very relevant um, in this case, so in this case of uh, fisheries, and it's very important to take into account the cost structure because, as you can see in the figure, although very fast due to the lack of time uh, today, we see that the growth of the cost is uh, very high, higher and higher when we move into those areas on the right, in which the gross added value is higher, due also to the high level of landings and catches. So we have uh, a kind of uh, decreasing yields and we have a kind of uh, lack of economic efficiency when uh, we look into the areas and in contrast to looking into the different vessel or fishing uh, clusters. Which is the main importance or why uh, the economic efficiency is it important? We can Next slide, please, uh, Paul. 
the idea of uh, providing the, the added value of the provisioning service is very important, but if uh, we need to look also into the economic efficiency, because the diseconomies by area that we are uh, uh, spoken about are translated into higher CO2 emissions. And it's very important to consider both the, the value of um, providing food but also which is the impact on the regulating ecosystem services through the carbon footprint. And as we can see in this figure, the, the areas on the, on the top right, which are the areas for which the gross added value is higher, they are also provide a very large amount of emissions of CO2. We have a, a smooth, a, a smooth uh, deviation from uh, one year to, to the following one, interannual deviation, but an increase around a 3% in five years, which is a very important figure in terms of the emission. So uh, we should take into account uh, which is the, in the balance, the economic value from food provision, but also which is the impact on uh, regulating ecosystem services due sometimes to a lack of efficiency, or at least this uh, impact on carbon footprint is sometimes uh, higher due to the lack of economic efficiency. That is the reason why we want to remark in Kafisman the necessity of providing uh, new knowledge, new economic knowledge to share with all the stakeholders and to consider it as part of the management of the different areas. And we need to engage also stakeholders to, to, to take into account which is the real relevance of the socioeconomic information. We have uh, other information by Bessel, as I have already commented for the gross added value. We have uh, plenty new knowledge, new economic knowledge and social knowledge by Bessel Lenz, by Fishing Technology. But I will show to all of you the geo tool with the information at the end of this presentation. And now, as uh, David has commented before, we need to complete the uh, economic assessment of the food provision and the impact on the regulating services with the uh, economic uh, value of the cultural ecosystem services. So, David, uh, please. And Thank Paul, you, next slide. Thank you, Arancha. Well, uh, as, as Arancha and me uh, told you before, uh, we, we cannot only consider the, the provisioning services when we are talking about value agent or putting in value what are features in the cost benefits analysis of policy makers. Uh, that's why we have to account uh, what is supporting features, which is natural heritage, and some other uh, ecosystem services like uh, cultural heritage or cultural services. In the case of natural heritage, we are talking about uh, physical and biological formations that uh, it have outstanding universal value in terms of aesthetic, scientific, or, or scientific point of view, geological and physiographical formations that are habitat of threatened species of animals and plants, and natural seas that are important as the, uh, since the points of view of, of science, and the criteria we use to identify these, uh, these uh, elements in terms of outstanding universal value and superlative natural phenomena of natural beauty, beauty geological and oceanography and ecological and biological process, which are uh, probably the most uh, important thing regarding fisheries together with the species and biodiversity. Here you have in this slide some examples of this uh, natural uh, heritage of, of Atlantic coast. Uh, we have the Picasso estuaries and Dopal Sea uh, Marine Natural Park, uh, which is uh, a natural park located in the place uh, in both, that involves an area of 2,000, or more than 2,000 kilometers, square kilometers of sea and estuary area since 2012. And it's very relevant because uh, uh, this ecosystem is next to, the, uh, to the, one of the most important ports in France, which is Poulogne Summer. Uh, the Chelsea uh, Bank and Fleet Natural Reserve, which is a, pro a marine protected area 
uh, that contain England's largest lagoon, where uh, continue existing um, traditional uh, fisheries with very uh, old uh, fishing gears, uh, focusing on targeting uh, green mallet or earring or mackerel. Uh, or the fish nursery grounds of the coast of Huelva in the bottom. This is a, a natural heritage located in Huelva that support all the uh, very diverse and uh, rich and productive ecosystem in, in the southwest of Spain, the Gulf of Cadiz, uh, with uh, different uh, grounds that are very productive in terms of primary production because of the nutrient flows of the Guadalquivir well River next to the Guiana National Park. Uh, regarding the, 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 the other provisioning services we are analyzing in the context of uh, Catfish Man, uh, we, we, we also want to talk about cultural heritage. We, we distinguish when we talk about cultural heritage between tangible cultural heritage and intangible cultural heritage. Uh, the tangible cultural heritage involves monuments and group of buildings. Uh, here uh, we have a couple of examples in the top. Uh, we have the, the Weymouth Historic Fish Market, which is uh, uh, an, an interesting uh, tourist attraction in, in England. Uh, the Nueva Umbria Tuna Trappers Installation and Building, which is a group of buildings locally called Reales, uh, that are the camps of the storehouse of fishing, of, for fishing here, some houses for sailors and workers of tuna traps located uh, in, in, the, in the case of Nueva Umbria in Huelva. Uh, but this is a tradition that, that, as you know, is all around, around the Mediterranean and, and there are many tuna traps all around there and have a very important in terms of historic, uh, the story, the story of, of life in, in, the, in the Mediterranean and the Gulf of Cadiz. The Snapweed Monster Story, which is an oral tradition and expression related to fisheries, and other social practice rituals and festive fitting, like the Sea Festival of Cap Breton, or some other uh, like performing arts, like uh, the Ronqueo of Tuna, which is uh, a performance of tuna cutting that take place in La Almadraba Square of the village of, of a small village called Isla Cristina, uh, next uh, to the trap of, La, of Las Cabezas that was uh, working until 1967. And the local name of this tuna cutting comes from the Spanish uh, roncar, which is roaring, which means snoring, uh, uh, which is very similar to the noise that the knife produced while, when the, when, when the the, uh, it uh, chafes uh, against the, the spin bone of the tuna. Uh, some other examples of, of this uh, uh, cultural heritage and knowledge and practice concerning nature and, uh, and the universe. Uh, for instance, we have uh, selected fishing uh, waves of Chilprona, or Chilpiona, which are structures of our waves built of stone walls whose top level allows the entry of fish during high tide and close exit and easy fishing during low tide. We have this uh, on the right. Uh, there are also uh, some other uh, expression of the knowledge about uh, nature in the case of the clay pot, Alcatruz, fishing gear of the Gulf of Cadiz. The clay pot locally known as Alcatruz is an additional fishing gear used to catch octopus in the Mediterranean and Atlantic spot in the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, and there is evidence that this uh, local name uh, of the fishing uh, gear comes from Arab's artisanal utensil called arkaduf, noted to water mills wheel, uh, that was used by fishermen to catch top placing in the bottom fishing ground as they could attract topus uh, in the sheltered sea. So, so this uh, fishing gear is based on the knowledge of, of the nature of fishermen uh, that the octopus is uh, all the time uh, looking for shelter sick, looking for shelter. Uh, another, another example of this cultural heritage would be the Barbate tuna, tuna trap, which is a, a, an historical uh, fishing gear, as I told you uh, before. Um, and this is uh, specifically located in, in the, the case in the Gulf of Cadiz, and probably the most important uh, in the Mediterranean and the Atlantic uh, side. Uh, given this, uh, what we have to do now in the contents of Catfish uh, uh, Mass is just identify all these elements. Uh, we have to make a database uh, that have uh, just uh, make a systematic search of documentations and these elements all across the, all along the, the Atlantic car. And what we are now doing, uh, please next slide, is just to go through 
uh, the measuring of the uh, or try to measure the total economic value of, uh, of fisheries. And then we have to add the provisioning uh, value we have been, that have been calculated and will be calculated in the framework of work impact six with a, a note free resolution. And, and we have to add to that value uh, the natural and cultural values. Uh, for doing that, we have to distinguish between use values and non use values. Uh, the use values uh, are those that come from the direct use or the indirect use of the of the of the fisheries uh, and the, also with the expectancy or the potential value that we get, get from from fisheries additionally there is also a non-use value uh, that uh, not go directly from the use that is just uh, generally divided between existence value and basket value that's to pre of preserving the the resource for future generations Regarding the evaluation method, we are uh, considering in the framework of catfish mount, we distinguish between market-based method, which is the one that's going, that is being applied in the context of working impact seven, and some other non-market-based based methods uh, that uh, distinguish between those that allow us to observe, that uh, take advantage of the observation of the preferences of the customer, that are called trivially preference methods, that include travel cost methods, hedonic price methods, uh, or adverting a uh, behavior uh, uh, and some other uh, method that uh, simulate the market because there is not a market for the for the the services we are analyzing and that are called uh, declared preference method. And among them, we distinguish uh, choice modeling and contingency evaluation. Uh, at the end of the of the of the, the result of this uh, working pack at sea will be just uh, evaluation of the importance of reef cultural heritage all along the, the Atlantic coast using these sort of methods and adding the value of this evaluation using the geo tool that Arancha is going to present now uh, to the provisioning value so that we have a, a, a better measure of the value uh, of, of features in terms of uh, cost benefits analysis by policymakers. So we are don't underestimate the value of fisheries in terms of the decision making, uh, of better decision making in the context of the management of fisheries. You know. So, so I, I, I now uh, give the, uh, the um, Arancha is going to introduce us the, the geo tools. So please, uh, Arancha, uh, next slide, Paul, please. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, now, uh, just to finish with this presentation, I will show to you. Um, uh, will show to you a couple of uh, tools, in which we are trying to put all the new uh, socioeconomic uh, information that we are generating in the context of the project. I have spoken before about the, the gross added value to assess the provision in ecosystem services by ISIS subregions, but it's not the only level of disaggregation. As uh, I have already mentioned, uh, also you can uh, will get the opportunity of um, take the information, but uh, by country, by uh, vessel length, by fishing technology, uh, any disaggregation you want will be available. Uh, please, uh, Paul, uh, do you mind to go to the web page uh, to show the, um, the GeoTool? While uh, Paul is opening the geo tool, uh, this will be available um, very soon. And for uh, uh, simplicity, now uh, we will show that in the in the um, in the right, you can uh, see uh, different uh, variables. Uh, we will increase the number of variables because, for instance, when cultural heritage values will be available, we will introduce also under this uh, geo tool. So you can click, for example, um, uh, Paul, if you want, you can click the gross added, at this moment, the gross added values click for the um, 2016 years and um, for all the countries. If you want, you can click uh, only one percent length. For example, you can remove uh, that uh, under 
under 10, yes, you can click, uh, yes, you can remove some bezel length. If you remove all, uh, the following one, yes, that remove, yes, for example, uh, if you remove, you will be able to get that information only for bezel length between 12 and uh, 18 meters, or uh, the year, uh, you can observe different fishing year technologies, or, so by clicking one by one, you can select, you can put two, two together, or and a list of uh, variables. Uh, in, at this moment, uh, I, I have introduced for this uh, uh, webinar, I have introduced some variables in relation with the uh, variable cost, non-variable cost, energy cost, uh, gross added values, uh, emissions of CO2, uh, the, the emissions intensity, that is the amount of emissions by landings, by uh, catch units. So, and as uh, I am commented, uh, we will uh, consider. Uh, and the most important, and uh, if you want, uh, Paul, we can come back to the to the slide. At this moment, this is the degree of disaggregation. I mean, we are uh, collecting all the information at ISIS region level, but very soon in the project, we will produce the same assessment and the same uh, ideas with higher spatial resolution. And you can get one, a couple of examples from the Bay of Biscay and the north of Edinburgh. Uh, please, uh, Paul, can you, can you uh, go to the next? Yes, for example, here, uh, this is no more than one example uh, uh, coming from the Bay of Biscay, in which, as you can see, we will uh, we estimate the gross added value similar to before, but uh, with a very high level resolution. And this is, uh, if you go to the next slide, Paul, this is very relevant in the context of uh, marine spatial planning, for instance, you can see uh, also in, sorry, the, the, the previous one, uh, Paul? Yes, in this slide, you can see also two expected marine protected areas, that, uh, those areas that you can see in the figure, and uh, which is the gross added value for, uh, in this case, there are uh, gill netters, uh, small scale uh, fisheries in the, in operating in the Basque Country. This is the high, the, the high level resolution uh, for which we will uh, want to reach in the project. And the next slide is uh, another example from the the north of Edinburgh, in which we are uh, able to allocate uh, the, the, the number of vessels uh, corresponding to a small scale uh, um, fisheries. And, and this is the, the, the level of disaggregation uh, that we want to reach in the context of the project, but with the same methodologies and with the same ideas as we have already commented for ISIS uh, large areas. And now, David, I think that you want to finish with the with another tool, David. Uh, thank you, Arancha. Uh, in the contents of working package six, uh, we we have also added uh, an additional tool for 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 stakeholders that consists of a, on, on a database of cultural heritage uh, documentation elements and references. Uh, or across the, the Atlantic Arc. Uh, this database uh, will be available uh, for, for stakeholders and will allow uh, uh, them to, to choose uh, information regarding the different elements uh, in the different uh, location uh, along the Atlantic Arc. Uh, please, next slide, uh, Paul. Uh, the, the database we, uh, will be available publicly, as I told you, in Mendeley and consists of, by now, of 990, uh, 992 registries that uh, I have to say that uh, this database will be alive in the sense that there will be people uh, after the project uh, involved in it and aggregating things in, in the database so that uh, we increase our, our information regarding the, the cultural heritage in the in the Atlantic are uh, we have here some some tables that summarize uh, what we have by now uh, uh, and there are elements classified in terms of transmissional and oral expressions uh, social practice ritual and festive events it is very 
Uh, it's remarkable that uh, one of the main uh, elements uh, of cultural heritage is our traditional craftsmanship uh, that consists mainly of very traditional and artisanal fishing, fishing gears and followed by social practice, rituals and festival, uh, festive events. There are many festivals all around Europe that celebrate the sea and fishing activity. Uh, by now there are a lot of information about Spain, uh, but for sure it will be, uh, there are more things about the rest of the countries that are, now, are not now included. Uh, Spain and Portugal are by now the countries with more elements introduced in the database, but it does not necessarily mean that there are no things or more things in some of the countries involved in the, in the project. But uh, by now, we, what we want in the framework of Catfish Man is just to have an idea of what uh, cultural heritage uh, related to fisheries in the Atlantic are in order to get uh, uh, an idea of uh, what we have to evaluate uh, to, to, in order to, to get this total economic value of fisheries uh, in the case of the, of the area we are analyzing. So uh, we are now also working in the framework of this database to identify elements uh, uh, in common of, uh, with all these registers all around Europe uh, in order to get a common typology at new levels in the Atlantic area so that we can uh, have uh, have an idea of, of what is available in terms of cultural heritage relative and what is going to be the value of that in the terms of of of, of cultural services of the of the fisheries. So that's that's all for for my part. Um, I think uh, for Arancha, so we are open for questions whenever.